So we're gonna talk about the parsnip package. So I'm just going through the slides that are already on this book down from um, someone named Jordan. So chapter seven is fitting models with parsnip. So here are objectives. It was a pretty short chapter. So we have um, identifying ways in which model interfaces can differ, how to specify a model with parsnip, how to fit a model, how to, um, how does parsnip generalize model arguments? And then a couple examples on broom tidy, and then, uh, making predictions. And then lastly, there are some, not every model is in Parsnip. So there are some um, additional packages you can use to use more models. Hopefully that makes sense. Here is a rough outline of kind of a workflow. So a modeling map. So here is tidyverse and ggplot would be more of your exploratory data analysis. Then we have um, train and testing splits here. And then we've talked before about recipes and how to set up your um, different data manipulations, etc. And we're now over here in this parsnip package where we're going to specify what kind of model we're going to fit. And then Eventually we will keep going. I don't actually know what yardstick is, but. I think you, it's about model evaluation. Mm -hmm. So about. Like... Okay. Um, then here is the code from the book used to set up the aims. We're gonna keep going on the aims data. Okay. So. The first part of the chapter was about different model interfaces. So here's a fun meme with Drake and we have Nintendo versus Xbox provide different interfaces to video gaming. So in the modeling world, um, in R, right, we have it's open source. So you can find many different interfaces to sort of do the same thing. Um, one example that they talked about in the book was linear regression can be do, done in different ways with ordinary least squares, regularized linear regression. So here are two interfaces you could use to do linear regression. One is just write the LM function, which uses the formula argument and then a data frame. And then in the GlimNet package uses the, then the alternative interface or the XY interface. So you provide a matrix, your design matrix X, which is all your predictor variables. And since it's a matrix, right, everything has to be the same. So everything's gonna be numeric. And then your output or your response is a uh, vector Y. And these can both do regression. Yeah. Okay. So how do we specify in Parsnip the model? Here is a little cartoon, this model specification assembly line. So you might build a car similarly to how Parsnip is building models. So we would start with the vehicle body, which might be, okay, what's the actual method you wanna use? So they, gave examples in the book of linear regression and random forest. So those would be sort of the method or the mathematical formula. Then you need to choose what type of engine you would like to use in this, you know, basically to run this mathematical formula. So for regression, you can use, right, the LM or the GlimNet that we just talked about. And then for random, I believe our part is a random forest engine. So we have our part and Ranger, our random forest engines. And then the last thing is you may need to set the mode, whether you're in a regression mode or a classification mode. And essentially this is just, do you have you know, a continuous outcome or a numeric outcome versus um, some sort of labeled outcome? 
Um, I think everyone here is probably familiar with those regression based yeah, classification. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, if you specify classification, then your predictions will be like class probabilities or what it depends on the model or? Yeah, I think it depends on the engine because some things will can give you a probability, like um, if you use like a logistic regression or that can give you a probabilistic yeah. prediction, but some things, um, like k-means mm -hmm. classification will only give you like a label prediction. Yeah. Won't be able to give that you a probability. Is it required to set the mode or? No, it, like... uh, it's not required because some things can only have a specific outcome. Can only right? have, yeah, one or the other. Okay. And then I guess if you don't set it, I'm not sure if it will automatically decide for you. I know um, there are some maybe engines that will do, you know, if you give a response, it can figure out for you what you want, but I don't know exactly an example off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I wonder if Glimnet can, we can look into it. Um, I know, yeah, there are some model interfaces that if you give it a character vector, it'll know then, okay, I need to do classification. Uh, does anyone have a? Uh, I, I just tried it and I think it has a default. So for example, the linear regression is by default has a type regression or mode regression and, and you can set it uh, to classification or you can leave it as is. So I guess that 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 other models might have also a default. Yeah, let me look really quick. Um, if you Yeah, okay. Anyway, I can't. Okay. So here now is just this picture in words. So we have that parsnip is a package that pr provides a philosophy or the philosophy behind parsnip is to create this unifying interface and make your workflow more predictable. Um, so we specify then the model type, say linear regression or random forest, and you can specify the engine, which is some packages implementation. Um, and I wasn't actually clear because like Glimnet and Ranger, those are package names, but they're also function names, whereas LM is just a function name. Um, so I'm not sure if the engine is always the package name or it didn't really say. Um, I think back to the point on models and modes, I think what I put in the chat isn't shows you models or model type, the package you come from, the modes you can set, and then the engine you can set. Okay, great. So that way, if you're looking for like a specific model. Oh yeah, they said there's like an add in, so right? I this think that's part like, of the add-in. That might be yeah. the add-in that they use. If not, that's somewhere to yeah. go out to to see. Yeah. So yeah, so like here, right, the package is model time, but then the engine is then like more of a function name. Yeah. Arima, auto arima. So I think those that are single might I wonder if it all deset defaults to regression, even if there are two of them. Like for the classification or regression, does it always default to regression or is it like sometimes it does? Or... 
Yeah, let's look. Oh, wait, hold on. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's just better to be explicit anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. So here is an example. We're gonna specify a linear model using the LM engine. And then if you print this object, this parsnip object, you kind of get um, a detailed description of what it is. So we specified a linear regression model with LM. Now, if we want to fit this specification, we can choose to use this fit, which uses the formula interface. And it will do kind of the R default behavior of turning any um, categorical variables into your dummy variables, um, which is pretty much default behavior for a formula interface method. Um, if you choose to use fix x, fit x, y, you, um, I think, would have to create your dummy variables yourself. What's not totally clear for me is that, so in the previous chapter, mm -hmm. they said that you shouldn't resort to the formula converting your nominal variables. So there you probably specify that, okay, I have nominal variables and I want to create dummy variables. And then in, in here, you use the original formula with, re with recipes or you have to use right. the end result of re recipes? Yeah, they didn't, right? Yeah, that's a good question because they didn't really bring it together. Yeah, probably we have to read the book further to <laughs> yeah. understand that, um, I guess. Right, because like, here we would probably want to go back to what we said in the recipes like because in recipes we already gave a formula yeah um yeah that's a good point does anyone i mean use I these know. packages i just suspect that the next chapter will 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 pull this together and and answer right. these questions yeah or even farther in i think okay. the um if you're using the workflow uh i think it defaults to your recipe so if you made a workflow yeah. and fit the yeah, workflow in it. yeah next chapter cool thanks is that, sorry, is that the only difference between X, Y and fit, just the dummies? I believe so. So if well, you explicitly create your own dummies, you can technically use fit X, Y and nothing changes. Yeah, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the function model.matrix. So usually if I need to use an interface that uses fit X, Y, I will use the model.matrix function first, which makes a design matrix for you. You give it a formula. It's basically like, kind of like a recipe, I would think. Like the, I mean, maybe I need to update my workflow and use recipes. It's like the R, um, base R function for making a design matrix. Um, 
So you give it a formula and it gives you the X matrix that would be made. So it, it's probably um, not preferred over recipes in the tidy world. But like I said before, I have not used these packages in my workflow before. <laughs> um, they are pretty new, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can specify different types of contrasts. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, I think it's more in like psychology, they do a lot of they construct these different contrasts to do hypothesis testing with groups. Um, anyway. Okay. Are there any other comments on these? No, okay. So here, um, we're talking about now the model arguments. So different inter interfaces for the same model might have different argument names for the same parameters. Um, and then they also might have additional options. So we can break these arguments into two sort of categories. So we have the main arguments, which are the parameters that you need to specify in order to um, use whatever mathematical model or formula you're trying to implement. And then the engine arguments are additional parameters that um, the package, like it's package specific. It doesn't really affect um, how the model is fit. It's more like, you know, do you want a verbose out printing in your console when the model is fitting or um, extra, extra things like that. So here is an example using random forest. So for the different um, packages that fit random forest have different names for the same parameters. These are the main arguments. So how many sampled predictors do you want at each split of your tree? Um, these two packages call it M try, and where Sparkly R calls it feature subset strategy. Um, how many trees do you want to build in your forest? We have three different names: num dot trees, n trees. I think this is a typo, and then num underscore trees. What should be the minimum um, split size? So we, again, we have three different names here. So Parsnip does something nice, and it just picks um, the universal names. So no matter what your engine is, whether you use Ranger, Random Forest, or Sparklier, you do not have to um, use the engine specific names. You just need to use the parsnip names. And here's a little meme. So parsnip is saving us from having to learn three different um, engine specific argument names. Okay. And then you can translate your code and sort of see how does Parsnip fill in the arguments to the engine that you set. So for our linear model, we can translate it and we can get this code printed out. And we didn't provide any um, formula. We didn't provide any information, so all of these just say missing. Uh, do you know how you can get information about the translation of argument names? So I guess if there are many packages to fit random random forest, then it's it's all written in the in the random forest parsnip functions mm -hmm. documentation. Or how should where should I yeah. search for it? I think there was an example uh, where I went on seven. Um, I think there was an example 
so you can see in this example, so it has the main arguments, which are the parsnip names. And then you would just have to like match up these values down here. Yeah. So we see trees is 1000, num.trees is 1000. Um, the min n, I think that goes down here, right here, five. So it's not super intuitive. Maybe they could have like put trees in here, you know, put these main argument names down here instead of the values might be, have been a little more intuitive. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess it's 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 better because the parsnip function has fewer arguments. But if you are coming from a package that that you already used, then you you have to know which parsnip arguments you should set. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah, that's a good question. I, yeah, I thought it was interesting. On this example, they gave penalty. Um, this argument is for the lambda, which is the amount of shrinkage, which also, by the way, I think it says in the GlimNet package, like you should never set it yourself. <laughs> um, for num numeric stability, but you can see here, like this doesn't actually ever come up in the code. Um, there are a lot more arguments you could set for GlimNet. I'm not sure. These might be the only ones that don't have defaults. I'm not sure how it chooses which ones to print. Um, yeah. OK. Is there any questions on this? That's the first section. I think we're good. Okay. So you created a model and you fit it. Now how to use the results. So we've seen this function before, tidy. So tidy can take your fitted model and return um, sort of a more readable output. So here we're just doing tidy on our linear model and then um, we get sort of this model output using, these are new names that Parsnip has created um, to clean up from the linear model. Usually it says like, this is like the probability of the absolute value being greater than T or something. Um, so, and then you, it also puts the row names into a new column called term. And so instead of dealing with um, row names and column names in a matrix, it, it turns things into a data frame. And then let's see now, and then we can use the glance function to convert the model summary statistics into a tibble. So here we have, um, some other summary statistics, R squared, adjusted R squared. I think this is like the mean, the estimate of the error. This is the test statistic, p-value, degrees of freedom, log likelihood, AIC. And I never looked into, I don't know what this random number here is. <laughs> so we just ignore it. Um, does cable print to the console, do you know, in a formatted way? Cable, um, to the console, it'll print the code that generated this. So this is HTML, so it'll print HTML code that you can paste into another document. I've used it before to print like LaTeX code and then put, paste that into a tech document. Um, so you have to have some compiler. Yeah, it works on the R markdown, right? If you like, yeah, uh, need it. Um, but yeah. is there a way to kind of like see in the console? Like, I don't know, 
maybe it's like a divider per rows and stuff. I think it prints in the viewer pane. Okay. I think when you, in the bottom right, the viewer, I think like where GT prints and stuff like that, where your plots, not, not your plot, but I think in that viewer pane is where the table is gonna appear, I believe. Yeah, I'm not sure how to get cable to print to viewer, but that, I mean, seems like that should be an option. Ooh. If you just run this is a table, so it will print in console as a table um, using the table um, specification. Okay. So again, by them consolidating everything to having similar names, we're, we'll see in the next section, it makes it easier to sort of join things together across different models. Um, so we can make predictions. And yeah, Daniel has in the chat, they don't always mean the same thing, these um, names. I think they mention in the book, um, like one engine uses a T test, but another one used the Z, which depending on your sample size, there's really no difference between them. Um, okay, so now we can look at how does Parsnip handle predictions across different engines. So they kind of came up with these three rules that they wanted to live by when they made predictions. So again, they always wanted to return a tibble and then they wanted to make more predictable column names. And then they wanted the feature where if you predict on a test data set that has missing values, you will still, your output will still be the same dimension. We'll still have the same number of rows as whatever your test data was. Because um, there are some predict functions that will just omit a row with a missing value instead of returning a missing value. Uh, so this might save you on having to do some, you know, case, case by case, uh, all right, coding. You know, you don't have to test if you have missing data before you put it in the predict function. So if we look at the aims data on our regression, we can see that if we predict, we now have this new table that has a column name dot pred. And so in, in the tidy world, they usually put dots um, to just avoid any sort of name conflicts. So generally a user would not name anything with a dot in front of it. So they, they kind of save that for themselves. <laughs> um, okay, so then it, since we have the same number of rows and we don't have to test for missing data, then we can easily just bind the columns together. So here we're gonna predict the, uh, we're gonna have the prediction and then we're gonna also add the prediction interval here for these five values. So we have our observation, the prediction, and then the lower and upper bounds of the prediction interval. And then this is all a table, so you know you can do whatever you want. You could calculate the residuals. You can make a plot. You can use all your tidyverse knowledge. Mm, okay. Any questions on prediction? And it's not in here, but let me go over here. They talk about for the classification since we 
talked about that earlier. They have this table of what the column names will be. So if you do um, a class, it'll have the prediction class. So this will be one column that will just give you, I don't know if it'll be the class number or the label. Um, if you have probabilities, it will give you a column for each level that you have. And again, I don't know if this will start at, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the levels would be. It would be a numeric or the actual name, but okay. Okay, so, um, They talk again about some tiny models adjacent packages. So there's this discrim package, which does a very similar, which can be used to use discriminant analysis in a parsnip way. So we can use um, this discrim flexible, which is this mathematical model, just like we saw before the linear, or lin reg and random forest, and then one example of a discriminant analysis engine is this earth engine. So here, this person just copied some example code from the discrim GitHub to do a flexible discriminant analysis. So we need to get these um, mathematical models from other packages because they're not all in parsnip as we saw in the link that who shared it earlier. Edgar shared. Um, so I guess it's, it's the same logic. They just wanted to limit the scope of parsnip so that the package is not, not so big, but, but the same logic applies to the other packages as well? Yeah, yes, exactly. They mentioned that if they added every model to parsnip, then the length of dependent packages would be, you know, so huge. <laughs> So they kind of, let, I don't know if the scrim is also from our studio, but they sort of let it out, you know, to the open to kind of put together these packages for other groups of models. Um, okay. Then that's the main content. There's a little summary. If I can find my arrow. So we talked about having a common interface, the different components. So we have the model, the engine, and the mode if needed. The two groups of arguments, the main, which are arguments you need to actually you know, estimate the model, and then the engine arguments, which are sort of these extra things. So like verbose, or if you want to run in parallel, you might give some um, arguments to run in parallel. And then the predictable behavior with the summaries, so using tidy broom glance, and then the parsnip predict making um, predictable prediction tibbles. And that's, you know, the chapter. Thank you. Uh, I have a question related to arguments. So do you know that you always have to provide the main arguments to the model specification, like random forest and linear regression function and the engine specific arguments to the set engine function or, or how? So where, where do you need to specify those, those yeah. arguments? Yeah, so... Um... I guess it would be the same as if you just ran that engine function yourself, where you only need to really provide argument values that don't have defaults is mm -hmm. what I would guess. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really get around what we were saying before about, you know, you probably still need to go to the help pages of the specific engines. Um, look around in there 
because I, I think, think these all have default values. I think the only thing you really like need to provide, right, is the data, either the X, Y, or the formula, and then the data. <laughs> yeah, but if, if you models. want to specify those arguments, then you have to specify those in the model specification and not in the fit function. So the fit function just takes specification and, and the data and, and nothing yeah. else. Yes, I think you're right. Yeah, so um, where was the bigger? Um, okay, so you set main arguments here in the um, the model mm -hmm. and then you set engine specific ones in the engine oh yeah here we go thank you what happens if we like put verbose in like the random fours will it not work or what will it give us an error telling us that doesn't go there <laughs> let's see because well, or look. like you put trees and set engine. Like if you put trees down here. Yeah, like what would it do? Would it just say this does not belong here? Let's see. Yeah, for both didn't work on my. On so, so you switch this to a different engine, and you got a like an error. Is that what you're saying, John? I guess it would depend on if the engine had like okay. dot 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 or not. Because some functions, right, if it has the dot 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 and you give an extra argument, it would probably just ignore it. That's probably what it's, it's probably doing that in the but argument you want. Uh, in, in the book, there was a warning about using the about in, in the fitting part, which I didn't fully understand yet. That one, I think. Uh, where is it? Here. Uh, no, I think later when it says that you shouldn't use the so this fit function gives you a complex object. Yes, that, that one. Okay, so yes. what, what confused me a bit is that, okay, I, I shouldn't use the fit part because it don't know about the transformation, but then when you use the so when you want to inspect the model, mm -hmm. then then you need to that. So so how how does it fit? Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing like these have different classes. So this will use a different method than mm -hmm. this. Like this would probably be your linear regression class, and how that method finds the data. Is going to be different than basically what I get this is saying is this isn't going to use the data you wanted to use to predict. Um, because yes, we're not so passing um, any new data here. So I think this just gives the fitted values. Um, Uh, yeah, you are probably right. Maybe it uses the base predict function and not from the parsnip package. Yeah, 
I don't have this code no run. You want to check the class of these. This is probably going to be some parsnip. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And this will be some just linear regression. Makes sense. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I feel like that in the book we learned some things that in later chapters they will tell us to forget. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Like there are some low level, some lower level functions. Yeah. Is there any um, anything else in the LM form fit object? Like I feel like the fit is actually you know the intercept longitude latitude, but I feel like it has other you know attributes type type stuff where you feed it to the yeah, let's um, see. to do something internally. Let's run this. Does anyone have it like already run that uh, they want to share or? Yeah, I see some stuff. So it, it, it has the specification. Do you want to share? Uh, sure. I, didn't, I just don't have it run. Uh, so it should be what the book book said. So the fit has the fit as, as you would expect, and there are some some other stuff there, but I'm not sure what what it means or okay. where does it come from. But maybe um, for a more complex model, I can imagine that there would be other other things as well they just measure the time for example it seems so without without you asking for it this is nothing what's the spec there i'm wondering if it's like a different type of prediction like a confidence interval maybe you want a probability i don't know yeah. uh, okay. So you mean that we fit the model? If you visit. yeah, scroll down on that help page, it'll describe all the slats, or not slats, all the. Uh, so for the fit. Yeah, you already have it open. If you just scroll down yeah, yeah. a little bit to the value, oh, it'll describe all, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what you would need this for. Maybe probably it says on the on the level there. It says if the outcome is a factor, which it doesn't always have to be. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's a classification versus regression type mm -hmm. reason that they don't recommend you to uh, straight away put the intercepts. I don't know. Yeah, so it says Yeah, it, it has special classes. What's the class of LM form fit dollar sign fit? Is it just LM? Yeah. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. so this is what they were saying about never use <laughs> the second one. So we'll do a different method. Mm -hmm. yeah. 